Okay, I am recording now. Okay, I'm also recording. Murder was the case that they gave me. You're listening to That Gets My Go. Hi, everybody. This is Big Anklevich. And this is Rish Outfield. And we're back with another episode of That Gets My Goat. I like to try and say that in, in like odd tones each time. That gets my goat. Just, you know, change it up. I did my homework. Hey, oh, oh, hey, sorry. Um, before we get started, I got to say something. <laughs> At one point in the history of this show, you told me that I was not allowed to use the term social justice, you know the rest. You said, dude, that's an offensive term. You're not to use it, okay? People will become upset if you use that. Warrior. <clears throat> there was a guy on Facebook who said he would unfriend anyone who used that, no matter what the context. So I thought... I, I think i got to say the same thing to you in this episode. <laughs> you're... you're uh, <laughs> You're not to say I did my homework in this episode. In fact, if you do say it, um, you know what? I'm going to replace it with Snoop Dogg saying murder was the case that they gave me. All right? I'm, I'm just warning you. We don't want to lose any <laughs> listeners because we have four. Was it Snoop Dogg that said that? Did you even know? Well, for fear of seeming uncool... I, I hope that Snoop Dogg said that. <laughs> All right. I, I mean, there is one way to find out, but I hope that you don't go for the cheap gag and deliberately say that. that okay. Thing. I'll try not to say but, I uh, did my homework anymore. <laughs> See, I, I warned you. Now I have to go out and find that clip. <laughs> You're making more work for me, man. Oh, that's right. You wanted me to keep this short so that you could get it out in time. Yeah. Um, well, too bad, motherfucker. This is... I'm sorry, there seems to be somebody else on the line. I, <laughs> I believe, for a second there, it sounded as though you uh, insinuated that my mother and I have an inappropriate relationship. Um, I mean, she breastfed me until I was 14 years old, but... I think that's okay. That's yeah. typical, right? That's not inappropriate. That's not the thing. Is Okay. Well, the thing is, about two or three weeks ago, I called you and I said, hey, here's an idea for a That Gets My Goat episode. I went to the cinema. Yes. I lifted my pinky finger as I drank my tea. And at the beginning of the movie, I won't uh, share with you what movie I went to see because I regretted it. Let's just say that it was about somebody <laughs> folding or bending or wrinkling time. And there were two Disney trailers back to back at the beginning of this movie. One was for Mary Poppins Returns. Mary Poppins? That's right. It's a lovely holiday with Mary. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, famed British actor Dick Van Dyke is not returning for the sequel, sadly. Aww. Sir Dick Van Dyke, rather. I Sorry. It, it's, it's a trailer where it just plays some mysterious music and it shows old-timey London and then a breeze blows in and something familiar is coming. Something that, that's been absent for far too long. That music they're playing, it's, it's familiar. I know that music. What? A, oh, look, up in the sky. And it's Mary Poppins. She's, she's come back. It's a bird. It, it's a plane. It's Emily Blunt. And uh, immediately after that trailer was a trailer for Disney's Christopher Robin. And in Christopher Robin, Christopher Robin has grown up and had a family of his <laughs> own. And he's... Disney's Christopher Hook. <laughs> and he's having hard times. But wait... What's that music? That sounds familiar. What's that sound? Whose voice is that? <gasps> oh my goodness, it's Winnie the Pooh. He's back. Do you remember Winnie the Pooh? Do you remember how you felt when you were a child and loved Pooh and Tigger and Rodent and... Donkey? Donkey, there donkey you go. Donkey was the name of the guy, right? And Eddie Murphy did the voice? Right, and, and Fiona and Shrek. <laughs> And, and it's just like, you know, Christopher Robin coming soon to theaters. And I was just like, you know, both of those trailers had like this same 
setup and they were both pushing the same buttons. And I, I called you and I said, Big, we probably should do an episode about like the attack of nostalgia or the onslaught, the, the assault of nostalgia right now. Because both of those were going for the same thing. And there's a million things going for that. But the fact that those were back to back really just nailed home how pervasive this nostalgia culture is. And so I thought I would talk to you and, and eventually let you get a word in edgewise um, <laughs> about this subject. In fact, do you have a word? I, I did have a word to put in edgewise. It was three words. I said, you know, tomorrow is the day that Ready Player One comes out. And I have never known any piece of media that was more intensely and completely built on nostalgia than Ready Player One. That was basically all it was. It's just a ripoff of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory done in computer land in which you can be any 80s character that you want. I don't think you can be anything but an 80s character, but you could be an 80s character. And so I said, let's go see that movie and we can talk about it and then talk about the further nostalgia culture that's going on here and and seeing if we can figure it out or put a put a finger on it understand it do you do you know the origin of the term nostalgia by any chance the etymology oh yes do go on let me put my pinky in the air and sip my tea and tell you that I haven't the slightest fucking clue what the etymology of nostalgia is. Do you? Well, nostalgia was a term that was coined, uh, I want to say at the end of the 1700s, to describe a mental condition. There would be <laughs> people that were institutionalized. They were, you know, taken to bedlam or, you know, an insane asylum. And they had lost themselves in their memories in... Back when it was an earlier time, back when they were happy, back at a a purer state of mind, it's like, you know, back when I was young and beautiful, back before the war, et cetera, et cetera, they would diagnose people with nostalgia. And I think nostalgia is a foreign word. It was like a, a Swiss word or something like that that basically translates to home sickness, uh -huh. but like a literal sickness you know she is being treated for nostalgia and as the years went on people eventually started to use the word in a positive way whereas before it was always just like oh geez it was a mental condition you know mm -hmm. and yeah now we use nostalgia well everybody uses nostalgia now but we use it as a way of looking back on your youth a looking back on your first love, looking back on a better time. A time when everybody was white. No, no, we won't be talking about that. Murder was the case that she Murder gave me. Murder was the case that she gave you? It, it, it's something that we all experience and that is being cashed in on all the time. Yeah, it's an, it's an interesting thing. And I, it feels like it's become much more of a business and much more of a, I guess, a business model than it used to be. I mean, everybody's had nostalgia uh, probably since the beginning of time. I don't know, but, you know, it's, it's not like my dad doesn't have nostalgia for the days of his youth. Uh, if he sees old pictures of himself, he'll tell you, I, I've talked to him about his life and heard his stories and, you know, how he used to try and gross people out by eating an onion like it was an apple. You know, oh, that was so funny when he used to do that as a kid. Ah, oh, the things they got up to back then. But uh, there's so much less of a business, I think, of nostalgia from those days than it is now. Or maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. What do you think? Do you think that it's become more of a thing? I don't think it's become more of a thing. It's just that 
the nostalgia radar is aimed our way now, whereas it used to be aimed at our parents. Like when we were kids, you'd see like time life records, <laughs> senior prom, go back to the fi- the music of the 50s and the early 60s. Put your head on my shoulder. Yes, Man. they're all here. Murder was the case that she gave me. And then you had, is that Freedom Rock? Well, then turn it up, man. Yeah, that was a whole industry based on the music of your youth is back in this this three-record set, two-cassette, also available on eight-track. And now there's just so many of us that have disposable income and they aim it at us. But it may be that we're starting to age out of that I don't know. Eventually, it's all going to be, you know, aimed at the people that grew up with Power Rangers and Alanis Morissette and Tramp Stamps and Bill Clinton. (laughs) Um, But right now, the 80s is just, that's where the dollar signs are. Yeah, it does seem like there's a little bit of a transition because there's been several things that you and I have seen. Like, yeah, uh, I mean, Ninja Turtles are great and all, but they were just, they were after my time, so I'm really not interested in going and seeing Ninja Turtle movies. And, you know, Power Rangers, eh, I think Power Rangers are really stupid because they came out after I was a child, and so I don't have any nostalgia for them from when I was little. The one I think that was the big success recently uh, of the 90s nostalgia is the Jurassic World movie, because Jurassic Park was a 90s thing. And it was an old enough thing that even us people who grew up in the 80s, uh, you know, still saw it and liked it. And so it works for us, too. So that's probably why it uh, really caught on better than the rest of them, I would guess. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess there have been all sorts of movies like set in the World War II era that, you know, my dad would have loved. Or set in, you know, the the 50s uh, that they would have thought was great. But I don't know. It still feels like it's a much bigger business than it was then. I think it was... sure. But everything has been commercialized. Everything is more so than it was. The, uh, The book It that Stephen King wrote had that nostalgia for the 1950s for a better time than in 2017 they make a movie of it but the nostalgia is for the 80s the 80s is the better time that they're talking about and I I wonder what that movie would have done business wise if it were set in 1958 rather than was it 88? I, I don't know when it was set I can't remember anymore 89 something like that yeah something like that I think it's basically 30 years ago from now I, I'm curious. I mean, there's no way of knowing, but I think that it did much better than it would have trying to flash back to a time that none of the target audience remembers. But shoot, uh, I guess you wanted to talk about Ready Player One. Oh, we'll get to it. The world of Ready Player One is sort of a, a catch-all of the 80s, right? I mean... I, see, it's, it's hard to express because almost none of it felt like the 80s to me. The only parts that felt like the 80s was when they were flashing back to the youth of Halliday, the, uh-huh. the Halliday character, and we were actually seeing vignettes from whenever that was, from 1984 or 88 or whenever it was supposed to be. It might have even been before 84 that it was supposed to be. Ready Player One, the thing about the movie is that it's, really, really different from the book. They have the general skeleton of the book, and that's about all. Everything in it was was changed substantially to, uh, to work better in a cinematic way. So I think while they did that, they changed a bunch of other things as well. And, you know, they threw in... I mean, there was plenty of nostalgia... But the it was a more sensical nostalgia, I guess. In the book, the mechanism for it was that 
the guy who has put the Easter egg in the oasis for everyone to find is hugely nostalgic for his youth. He loved everything about his youth and he, everything he did was made to go back to his youth. So, you know, he loved Atari games and he loved the arcades and he loved uh, the movies from his youth. And w one of the challenges that you had to do to pass was like to quote all the lines from the Holy Grail. And another one was to quote all the lines from war games. And, you know, the they do give you the idea of why it would make sense for all these people in like the, tw what is it, 2048 or something like that? When the movie well, that's when the set. movie was set. I don't know if, I don't know if that's yeah, the same. Yeah, and you, you can imagine how much people would know about the 80s in 2048. That's what, 60 years ahead? So imagine how much we know about... Uh, 1957? Is that 60 years ago? Is that really all... Is that really all the further back it goes? <laughs> that can't be right, right? Can it? Well, 78 was 40 years ago. Holy shit. Okay. <laughs> So, yeah, um, I'm, I'm sorry, are you just now realizing that you are old? <laughs> Holy cow, we got it on tape, kids. Yeah, uh, I was just surprised at how short a time ago it was to be 60 years. But imagine, like, all teenagers now, how much they know about 1958. Nothing, you know, you, you'd be lucky if they know anything. I mean, they learn a little bit about it in, uh, like, history classes. But in general, they don't know anything about those days. And uh, this movie, or the book, I should say, the movie does it a little bit, but way to a smaller degree. The book, it's all about, you know, these kids just studying everything about it. And they, and they know every last little bit of minutia about the 1980s and, and late 70s. And it's... They play Dungeons and Dragons games from those days, and they play Atari games. And I can't imagine any kid from the 2040s not just being unbelievably bored to death by Atari games, where your graphics are nothing, you're just a dot that runs around. Like, they, they use Adventure as the big finale game. And yeah, that, I mean, I even thought that was kind of lame when I was a kid and it was new. Yeah, I don't know. It, it's kind of unbelievable, that whole thing, which in a way they did away with it to a certain point in the movie. They have all sorts of crap in there. They have guys that play in avatars that are like Halo guys. And there was a guy I saw who was a Ninja Turtle. There was all sorts of different ways that people would play. Which would be the way it would be, you know what I mean? I mean, it would be super varied. And when it comes down to it, the majority of the stuff would be stuff we hadn't even seen yet here in 2017. Because, you know, you got 30 years of characters being created. Although maybe not, since all they're doing is recycling old characters again. Uh, maybe they'd just all be the same characters that we already knew. Well, Spielberg has done this before, this... I mean, I'm sure there are other examples, but I'm immediately thinking of Jaws, where he took the idea of the book and threw out a lot of the, the, the book. And, and in Jurassic Park, they took the idea of the book and threw out the things that Spielberg felt didn't work. And maybe there's a fourth one, but this really feels like the third of those. And to me, that made it way, way more accessible because I feel like the movie of Jaws and the movie of Jurassic Park are superior to the books. But usually, the book is better when a movie is made from something. And yeah, characters having to go through the entire movie of war games, quoting line by line, playing as Matthew Broderick, is not cinematic. But them having to go to the Overlook Hotel from The Shining, you know, and just facing the scariest moments from that movie... I think is super cinematic. And I, you know, I don't know how much Spielberg had to do with that, 
of saying, okay, I like this and I like that. Oh gosh, can we change the locale for this second quest or the what third quest? Can we change this? It became much more cinematic. And usually when you've read the book first, you go see the movie and you're disappointed. You say, dang, you know, they cut out this and they left this part out. And this makes no sense unless you've read the book. But I felt like the movie, that's not the case at all. Things that bothered me in the book don't even apply in the movie. The, they, the, he, they restructured the story so it's so much more like a movie, like a you know, first act, second act, third act, with a villain and a likable protagonist and all that stuff. You may have a different opinion. Uh, no, I actually uh, agree a great deal with you. Um, I, th- I don't know whether I think that the book or the movie was superior. They were so different. It's almost like the, it's almost like Spielberg had a broken mirror contest with Ernest Klein, and they just said, "Okay, here's the uh, here's the idea: a guy dies who created the internet, and he's going to give the internet to somebody." Okay, so it's like Willy Wonka, but with computers. And go. Oh, I, mean, <laughs> I guess they had a few more stipulations. Okay, you get these characters. There were some things like the uh, characters of Daito and Shoto. I think his name was Shoto, but for some reason in the uh, movie they only called him Sho. But uh, those two characters were from Japan in uh, the book, which I kind of like that. I mean, it's a small, stupid thing, but I liked that a little better than them just all suddenly showing up in America. You lose all their side story, but you can only have so many stories in a book. I mean, in a movie. You you can't have as many as you can have in a book. You can do so much more because you have so many more words, so much more time to develop things. So you have to cull it down to just the the facts, ma'am. But yeah, I thought that the movie was probably the best version of a movie that you could make. Of that book, I, I was I was really impressed with. It. I thought it was really good, and yeah, you asked me to talk to my kids because I went and saw it with my kids yesterday, and you wanted me to ask my kids if it felt like the movie was made for them or if it was made for you know a bunch of forty year old guys like you and I, and they unanimously said that they felt that it was not made for 40 year old guys but that it was just as accessible to them as it might have been to me and they and they admitted that there were times that things happened and i laughed at them and they didn't see the humor they they didn't understand why i was laughing and that was just because i got the reference that they were going for like as iron giant sinks into the lava and then he sticks up his does the thumbs up you know, I recognized that he was copying the Terminator 2. They did not, because I don't know if they've even seen Terminator 2. Or Terminator 1, for that matter. And there were several other moments like that, that, you know, there was a little joke uh, worked into the stuff that they didn't get because they didn't have the frame of reference for it. But they didn't feel like it wasn't as good because of that or that it wasn't for them because of that they just kind of went along and said okay well this weird guy sitting next to me is laughing i don't know why but still a good movie i thought that was really good i thought that that was the best way that spielberg could have done it because nostalgia is i guess it's kind of a good business plan but it can't be the only thing that you base stuff on because the people who really go out and blow a shit ton of money on movies are children. They're not 40-year-old guys in general. Although these days, a lot of 40-year-old guys like us, you know, a lot of us have no kids or things like that. And so you have the ability to spend that money on yourself instead. You can collect toys, although I still do plenty of collecting of toys despite my children. You can blow the money on whatever you want, including movies. And so maybe that's why it's a bigger business now than it used to be, and more things are aimed at that kind of an audience. 
But it doesn't always work. I mean, I remember you talking similar to this experience that you had with the uh, Mary Poppins and the Christopher Robin movie. You talked about, it was, I don't know how many years ago it's been now, but they put out a Winnie the Pooh hand-drawn animated feature, 2D animation, and I think it may have been the last 2D that they did, right? Uh, it came out after Princess and the Frog. Yeah, it was around the same time that Frozen came out. Like, it was the summer and Frozen came out that winter. And it was all based upon, remember how you felt as a child. Remember those friends in the Hundred Acre Wood. And it was such an effective trailer for me who was just at the very tail end of youth or or somebody who was alive when those Winnie the Pooh films came out. And it was just like, oh, it really spoke to me. I believe I actually cried during the trailer, even though I didn't have an emotional connection to Winnie the Pooh or Eeyore or any of those characters, but I had an emotional connection to childhood. And then that movie came out and nobody went to it. He didn't do a goddamn thing. Yeah. And when Frozen came out five months later or four months later, it had the absolute, with a capital A, worst marketing of any film I have ever seen in my life. (laughs) And maybe I shouldn't say worst, but the most dishonest marketing campaign. And I wonder if any of that had to do with the reaction to the nostalgia grab that was that Winnie the Pooh thing. Because if they had said, and I think we talked about this on that road trip home from Las Vegas, if they had said, remember how you felt when you went under the sea. I remember the tale as old as time. Remember flying above Agrabah on a magic carpet ride. Now come with us again to the world of make-believe with an all-new Disney princess and her you know, whatever. Where it's just like, hey, remember the Disney Renaissance? Remember those Disney musicals and how much you loved them? Well, we're making another one, by God, and it's called Frozen, and it kicks ass and it has nothing to do with a fudgin talking snowman losing his nose in the snow. And, and I just, I felt like that was such a huge wasted opportunity of like, wow, that's what that movie was. And ultimately, Frozen did great at the box office, but it was one of those movies that did great because of word of mouth, because of people saying, oh my gosh, did you hear the songs? That song that you're hearing on the radio 20 times a day, that's from Frozen. Oh my gosh, those dolls that nobody can find at the store? That's from Frozen. That that movie. Oh my gosh, do you remember when you were a little girl? This movie will make you feel like you did when you were a little girl. But if they had cashed in on that from the ad campaign, I think the movie would have opened huge. I don't know that it would have made a dollar more, but it would have made more from the outset rather than from three weeks later, four weeks later, five weeks later, which almost no movie does anymore. Right. And I'm sorry, that was a huge tangent. No, I sent you on that tangent. But the cash-in for nostalgia is powerful. And it can be nostalgia for something you haven't even experienced. You know what I'm saying? And so maybe... Can you give me an example so that I can know what you're saying? No, no, I'm just saying... I I can't remember what the trailers for Ready Player One... I, I can't remember what they were like. But I'm sure that they were filled with 80s music. Yeah, one of them had Jump. Oh, okay, it had Jump from Van Halen. And one of them had uh, Tom Sawyer from Rush on it. Well, see, I I remember one having The World in My Eyes by Depeche Mode on it. Probably. um, Which isn't really a a nostalgia song for the 80s, because that was a 90s song, but it's thematically, let me show you the world in my eyes, you know, it's thematically going along with what Ready Player One was. But while we were watching the movie, any time there was an old classic 80s song that played, my cousin would lean over and he'd say, I bet you love this song. Like it was a criticism. 
<laughs> it's just, yeah, okay. So Joan Jett and the Blackhearts sing, I hate myself for loving you. And everybody in the audience, except for one person, is going back to when they knew that song. But my cousin leans over and says, oh, I bet you love this song. It, it was weird. I mean, he I, I, he was the exception <laughs> to the, the rule on that movie. But there were also, like, images pre-80s, like Godzilla. Mecha Godzilla is so pre-our generation. Yeah. I've never seen Mecha Godzilla in a movie. <laughs> Me neither. Yeah, I never saw it. King Kong. King Kong is from our grandparents' youth. Right. Yeah, there was a 2005 King Kong. There was a 1978 King Kong and all that stuff. But to really feel nostalgia for King Kong, I think you have to be our parents' age or older. And so maybe that was kind of a fun thing where, you know, Spielberg is like, well, King Kong speaks to me. Mechagodzilla speaks to me. You see, the funny thing is, in the book, they had some really old and kind of goofy stuff that got removed. Like, for example, he wins the thing that makes it so he can turn into Ultraman. Like, my son had never even heard of Ultraman. And I think another thing he wins uh, so that he can turn into the giant robot that Spider-Man had in the Japanese TV show of Spider-Man, where he had, like, a giant robot. Of course you have to have a giant robot in a Japanese show, and so Spider-Man did... And those things were gone, but I guess Mechagodzilla was their replacement. Okay, well, but see, Spider-Man is such a deep dive <laughs> that if I feel like only the diehard nerds, and I probably the ones that criticized all the changes being made from this sainted book, are the ones that are going to catch who Spider-Man is. <laughs> but uh, I feel like the changes that they made... And, and like, okay, you and I have no nostalgia for the Iron Giant. We were too old when that thing came out. Plus, Vin Diesel. <laughs> I, didn't, but, I didn't know it was Vin Diesel. Vin Diesel wasn't a thing back then yet, so I didn't hate him. But your kids probably got a visceral reaction to seeing the Iron Giant. Uh, oh, and also Marvin the Martian showed up for a second. And he predates us, although you and I both know who he is. Yeah, Marvin that might Martian, be an, I missed that him. That might be another thing that Spielberg's generation would be like, oh yeah, hey, look. I don't know. I, I, I feel like they were trying not to exclude your kids uh -huh. and our parents. But because most of the music was from our childhood, I feel like we were the ones that would get the most out of that. I don't know. I, I could be wrong because... I honestly wanted to know the answer to that question I had you ask your kids. I, I wasn't, it wasn't a loaded question. <laughs> I don't know if the movie was made for us or was made for millennials or was, you know, just made for as big an audience as possible because it didn't feel like it was the 80s or anything like that. I mean, it, it, it looked like cutting edge technology, video games where they'll be, you know, in 20 years kind of thing. You know, I, I, unlike the book, I didn't feel like you had to be steeped in minutia of 80s culture to enjoy it. Yeah, I felt that that was definitely the case. And I, I think that's interesting that that was the case because that seems to be a rarity, to tell you the truth. Like, nostalgia is coming up in everything these days. Like, the biggest show around recently has been Stranger Things. And that's just, hey, look, 80s. Look, the kids dress up as Ghostbuster for Halloween. They play Dungeons and Dragons. They're nerds. They ride their bikes around. So it's like when you were a kid. You should love it. And I don't know how much the younger generation likes it. I know that my daughter watched it. She watched it better than I did, for that matter. <laughs> we were watching it together. But I'm, like, the worst for watching stuff together with because, uh, you know, I'll watch, like, three episodes one Saturday with her. And then I won't watch it again for, like, three months. And then we'll watch some more. And we'll be like, what happened last time? I don't remember anything. And so eventually she gave up on me and she went ahead and watched the rest of it. And then watched the second season as well. Without you. Yeah. 
I've, I've never asked her how she likes it. And I mean, she likes it obviously enough to watch it all the way through without me. But yeah, I don't know how much, if the setting and everything about it seemed uh, off-putting or not to her. I don't know. I, I feel like the generation of children that are coming up today are a little more clued in to the, the big things of the 80s. And probably because they're making movies of all of them or new TV shows of all of them. You know, my kids know all about Voltron. They know all about the Transformers because there's movies, there's TV shows. They know all about uh, the Ghostbusters. They've seen the Ghostbusters movies. They've even seen the real Ghostbusters cartoon. Um, you know, they know all about... Uh, yeah, what's something else? Star Wars. They know all about the Sectars. They know all about... I don't know. All that stuff. You're not going to get anything more obscure than Sectars. <laughs> I think there was a Mad Balls reference in Ready Player One, and I was just like, oh, well, you had to have been a kid between 85 and 87 to get that reference. Because <laughs> Mad Balls were not a huge thing. I'm trying to even remember what they were. I, I recognize the name for it, but I don't remember it. What was a Mad Ball? Remind me. They were just squishy foam balls with gross faces on them. And you were supposed to collect them all. <laughs> what? That's new. And There's no other toy that tries to do that. <laughs> well, you, you, you opened that door by mentioning sectars. <laughs> <laughs> if there's anybody listening that remembers the sectars, then I tip my hat at them. <laughs> I figured I'd do the, the, the Rish Outfield style uh, joke where you name a bunch of things that are normal and then throw in one thing that's totally obscure or totally gross or totally wrong and just slip it in there as though it was also normal. But oh, <laughs> see, and I shined a light on it. Uh, I put I, a hat on it and I wish that I hadn't. Oh, sorry. I needed to come up with one more thing, though. Oh, okay. All I was doing was looking at my toy shelf and going, okay, what's something else from the 80s? But stumbled and fell. Well, they, the studios continue to try. They swing for the fences with these things because they know that even if they strike out three times in a row, the fourth time might be like the Michael Bay Transformers movies, which continue to make a gargant... Well, not the last one. But there's another one coming, so, you know, they, if, if they can push the buttons of nostalgia just right, they will. Uh, oh, Jumanji is a great example, even though it's not from the 80s, that, do you want to call it a reboot or belated sequel? Did you see that? Oh, you didn't, because it has The Rock in it. <laughs> I didn't see it, but I was tempted to, I'll have to admit. Was it any good? Yes, it was very good. Huh. And I didn't feel like it was um, irreverent toward the original Jumanji in the same way that Jurassic World is a follow-up to Jurassic Park rather than a remake or a reboot of Jurassic Park. You know, The Force Awakens is a follow-up to Return of the Jedi instead of just a reboot of Star Wars. And uh, that's what Jumanji uh, welcome to the jungle was as well. <laughs> and it was so insanely successful that they're going to make another one. Oh, so and it made a lot of money too. Huh? That was the other question I was going to ask you. Yeah, it was Sony's most successful movie ever. And that doesn't mean as much as it should because, as you're always pointing out, every year something is going to outgross the the box office champ. These... Records are made to be broken now, but uh, past Spider Man. But Sony did Spider Man, <laughs> the 2002 Spider Man, as the the biggest Sony hit of all time. So that means something. Yeah, it spoke to a lot of people. It is, it is fun, and uh, I I thought it was really well acted, and it was the first movie in a long time where I didn't hate Jack Black. <laughs> I bet you're really looking forward to the house with the clock in the walls now. You know, I saw that trailer at the beginning of 
Ready Player One? I'll bet it was attached to Ready Player One. I think that's yeah. a Spielberg production. It was, yeah. It's an Amblin. I saw that trailer as well, and my daughter complained that it has the stupidest name ever. Huh. I don't, I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what she thought. I mean, it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't ballistic X versus Sever or anything like that, but, you know, still got a pretty lame title. But it's a quirky title, you know? It's like Chloe, Joey, Zoe, and David Bowie. <laughs> Which you probably think is the worst title ever. Well, I'd like it a lot more if it were just Chloe. <laughs> there was a movie just a month ago or so that nobody went to. Came and went. It was one of those where it played for like 10 days in the theater before they pulled it. And it was originally called... Gosh, it had a good title... It was called Category 5, which is what you use to designate like a terrible thunderstorm, a, a huge hurricane kind yeah. of thing. I believe Hurricane Katrina was a Category 5. Right. Uh, but right before it was released, they decided to change the title to Hurricane Heist, which I'd say is up there with Ballistic X versus Sever in how shitty a title it is. <laughs> I mean, Ballistic is such a weird title where you're just like, what? Are, are any of those words supposed to mean anything to me? Whereas Hurricane Heist is just so... It's got alliteration. Hacky sounding yeah. and, uh, you know. Cheesy. Just... It makes you think of like really... a Disney movie like The Computer Wore Tennis Shoes or That Darn Cat or something. You expect that Tim Conway and Don Knotts would be starring in it or something like that. Anyway, that was a tangent uh, because your daughter didn't think the house with clocks in its walls. Is it clocks or with a clock? I'm not sure. I think it's with a clock, but I could be wrong. I've only seen the title once. That was all it took. Well, we'll see when that movie comes out if, if people complain about the title. If other people complain about the title. Um, it didn't strike me as hurricane heist level <laughs> bad, but that's, that's just me. Uh, and and the uh, the worst thing is when a movie is a sequel, but they call it by the name of the original movie, like the prequel to The Thing being called The Thing. That's worse than any ballistic X versus Sever. People need to go to jail for that yeah. or go to hell. What about The Wolverine? Does that one count in that? You know, I'm going to have to flag that as as breaking the rules as well. Um, I, I guess technically the 2009 movie was called X-Men Origins Wolverine, but uh, it still should have uh, precluded them from calling the other one The Wolverine. Yeah, I complained about that mightily when that movie was coming out. Wolverine, and part two is called The Wolverine. Well, yeah, and, and not to get on this, but the fourth Rambo movie was initially called John Rambo. And then I think they shortened it to, our film professor said, I'd like it a lot more if it were just called Rambo. <laughs> and so and they said, like, oh, okay. But the second one was called Rambo. You, uh, he's like, well, too late now. <laughs> Too late. We already printed out all the ad material. All the posters are up. You can't change its name to Live, Die, Repeat. <laughs> I heard that uh, they're seriously talking about making a sequel to that. And they will call it Live, Die, Repeat and Repeat. That's such a shitty idea that I, I'm starting to think that it can't be true. <laughs> uh, what was that movie actually called? It was called Something of Tomorrow. I want to say Edge of Tomorrow. Yeah, that sounds like that might have been it. I've, yeah, I've, I've just got to get a judge's ruling on that because, wow, that's a bad title. Yeah, it was oh. just a generic sci-fi title. It's like it could have been No, any... no, no, no. Live, Die, Repeat and Repeat is what I'm talking oh, about. Oh, okay. It's, that is just... Ugh. The Edge of Tomorrow was was Hurricane Heist-like. <laughs> How dare you. In its blandness and its genericness. Could have been any one of a 
the hundred Isaac Asimov books from the 50s or something like that. Oh my gosh. In January 2018, Doug Lyman revealed that the title of the sequel is Live, Die, Repeat, and Repeat. Wow. They're really going for it, huh? I'm surprised they're doing a sequel for that movie. It didn't do well, did it? Not theatrically, but once they retitled it on video, I guess, word of mouth, people liked it. Once they gave it a new name, everybody's like, whoa, I'll try that. (laughs) I've never heard of this live, die, repeat movie, but I'll watch it. I like it a lot better now that it's just called The Hunted. We'll never let that go. That has be- <laughs> that has eclipsed like all the good memories I have of that professor to be like the thing that I think of the most. <laughs> he like loaned you a thousand dollars, gave you a car, and let you live in his house for six months, and still the only thing that you can think of about him is I'd like it a lot better if it just said the hunted. That's weird. <laughs> Anyhow. I feel like we've stopped talking about nostalgia, and I really miss when we used to get together and talk about nostalgia. Yeah. Those were good times. Those were good times. We should, we should do that again someday. Anyhow, let's call this a night. One thing that will be fun uh, is uh, sometime in the future the, that Han Solo movie is going to come out. And it will be interesting if they're trying to create nostalgia for people who were around for the original Star Wars, or if they will just aim it at young people who are the age of the Han Solo character in that movie. Although, with those where they're tentpole blockbuster releases, they'll probably try and do both. They'll try and... It'll be nostalgia for people who really miss the prequels. Yeah, that's inevitable. I think that's going to happen at some point. And maybe that that scene at uh, Canto Bight was for those people. Yeah, could have been. Yeah, that friggin' Star Wars movie comes out like next friggin' week or something. I couldn't believe it when I saw I saw the trailer and it said, coming in May. And I was like, what? That's really soon. How is that possible? I thought that that movie was like fraught with problems and stuff like that. How is it that they rushed it out so quick? Well, sadly, my guess is they threw more money at it. You know, that's what happens with these movies, like the Hobbit trilogy or whatever, where there's all this problems and we, oh, it was two movies and now it's going to be three movies. Well, let's just spend a lot more money to get the the effects done in time and uh, to, so that it doesn't miss its release date. This is a movie that would have benefited from missing its release date. I think we'll talk about that when the movie comes out. You especially are going to say, hey, you know what, Rish? And I'll say, what, Big? This movie was too soon. We don't. We needed a wait between the Star Wars movies. Yeah, the last one came out in December, right? Am I, am I crazy in thinking that? Or it really did, You're right? not crazy. It was less than six months in between Star Wars movies. Has there ever been a series of movies that came out so quickly? I guess The Matrix 2 and 3 did that, didn't they? Matrix 2 and 3, Back to the Future 2 and 3... Back to the Future 2 and 3 came out within six months? Yeah. End of 89, summer of 90. That's interesting. Um, I don't remember that. But both of those movies were were cliffhanger endings where they shot both of them at the same time. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see if other people say, uh, you know, hey, too soon, guys. (laughs) Too soon. You can't make jokes about that yet. (laughs) Too soon to make jokes about porgs. Oh, hey, that's good. When uh, we do an episode, another That Gets My Goat, maybe the audience will say, oh, hey, too soon, guys. We're (laughs) used to three months passing between episodes. (laughs) That's right. They'll be like, oh my gosh, I haven't even finished the last one yet. I'm still listening. I haven't gotten the bad taste out of my mouth yet. I do them in five-minute chunks each day, and, uh, and I've still got a month to go. Before I finish, because your episodes are four hours long. <laughs> <laughs> I remember somebody complaining back in the Dune Steef days that our episodes were just too dang long. Like their their uh, what do you call it? Their commute was twenty eight minutes or thirty one minutes, depending on traffic. And sometimes our shows wouldn't be done 
by then, and they just have to turn it off and uh, unsubscribe. So uh, it's just, I, I feel nostalgia for those days <laughs> when uh, we just had too much content. Yeah, those were the good old days. People were incapable of pausing the MP3 back in those days. Yeah. Maybe we can uh, bring those days back somehow. Maybe get some millennials or Generation Z interested in it. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if that's going to happen. But before <laughs> long, I mean, you and I are old. Before too long, there's going to be people with nostalgia for podcasts. Yeah. They'll go back and listen to our old original episodes. No, that that ain't gonna happen. We're we, we're gonna <laughs> seem too old. All right, we are circling the drain here at this episode. We need to just call it a night. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for uh, joining me another time, and thanks for not saying that thing that I asked you not to say a lot because I, I I was worried you were gonna do it a bunch. Uh, yeah, I considered it, but truthfully, I forgot about it. So. Oh, go. good. Senility, once again, wins out. If people want to mention something in the uh, comments, I'd be curious about what pushes your nostalgia buttons. Uh, just the, the kind of thing that I, I... If somebody wants to go out and, and see that trailer for the 2011-2012 uh, the Winnie the Pooh, you know, what else does it for you? What, what, is it a song? What is it that you have nostalgia for that brings back your youth Im- immediately? Yeah, that'd be interesting to find out. And then cash in on. <laughs> yes, yes, as, because we will buy the rights to that with all that Dune Steve money that we're not spending going to movies together. Yeah. Yeah, I think you and I are going to spend that money to bring back Filmation's Brave Star with the talking horse and the intergalactic sheriff and other things that were like He Man. Yeah, I can't wait. That probably is the thing that most people get their nostalgia button pushed by. I'm, I'm willing to bet. I'm going to put some money on that. I'm going to put some Dune Steve money on that. That's I'm right. I'm go to Vegas. Yeah, Do- donate to our <laughs> Kickstarter. Yeah. Braver Star is what we're going to call it because Hurricane Heist wasn't crappy enough. No, Brave Star has two R's at the end, so we just need to put a third R on. Brave Star with three R's. <laughs> okay, done and done. All right, we'll see you next time, folks. Thanks for listening. Good night. That Gets My Go it is produced under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. Which between you and me means nothing. Murder was the case that they gave me. And, uh, and yeah, we will remake. Uh, oh, shoot, what's it called? Uh, Filmation did a a follow up to He Man, and it was about a, a like an intergalactic space sheriff. Oh, yes, it does. Does that sound familiar? Something Star. It was Brave Star or Lone Star, or you you don't remember what that was? I think it was Brave Star, and it had two R's. Okay, well, if you're sure that's what it is, then that's the joke I'll make. When was that from? 1987. And apparently his horse was like his buddy and could talk, and I guess that's like cringer, so that shouldn't be a surprise. Yeah, I mean, it was absolutely a a knockoff of He-Man, done by the creators of He-Man.